This is the day you've all been waiting for. It's time to analyze UCLA softball. Number two team in the country. Are they championship or bust? Let's tell you on Locked On UCLA. You are Locked On UCLA, your daily podcast on the UCLA Bruins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey everybody, it's your favorite host, it's Zach Anderson, the Oxheimer, welcoming you to the Locked On UCLA podcast. You can get this podcast for free wherever you get your podcast, and it's available if you're watching all you viewers on YouTube. Thanks for your likes, comments, and subscriptions. Thanks for your support. In the meantime, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more by visiting fanduel.com slash locked on right now. Today, go and get it started. Rocking and rolling as I tease, the Bruins are the preseason number two team in the country under Kelly Inouye Perez, who recently in the fall of 2022 was in the most recent class of the UCLA Hall of Fame class of 2022 with many Bruins. So great to see the head coach, just the only the third head coach in UCLA history, but for UCLA seeing Inouye Perez get inducted to the Hall of Fame, looking to get the Bruins back to the pinnacle, get to the peak and become national champions for the first time since 2019. Last year's team, let's recap who's coming, who's going, what are their expectations, what does this schedule look like? The Bruins last year, 51-10, and 19-5 and in conference, didn't win it, lost it out to Arizona State as the Bruins lost to ASU and lost to Stanford last year in a couple of Pac-12 series in a rare stumble in the midseason part of the year for the Bruins. UCLA, a lot of hope for this year but it was their first double-digit loss season since the 2015 through the 2015 se- 2017 season. So 15, 16, and 17 were those years the Bruins' last loss had 10 or more losses and now are looking to get themselves back into single digits and compete with that one school in the state where the Women's College World Series is hosted. So they want to take down those pesky Sooners and prove that the premier softball program is where it should be at the top and go beat down the Sooners. But what's it going to take to get there? Who do they have coming back? What's missing? Well, from last year's team, they're losing Delaney Wiz, Brianna Perez, Kinsley Washington, Holly Acevedo. And for the Bruins, that is your top three hitters from Coach Inouye Perez's lineup, your team leader in ERA with 131 innings with Holly leaving, a batting average of 172 against, the best on the team compared to that to Megan Farimo. So for the Bruins, they're losing some key pieces. You can read different pieces. Everybody around the country can agree. Key veteran pieces are missing from this UCLA team from last year that went 51-10 and near the top in the Pac-12 tournament. And they're trying to find ways to become national champs again. Well, with with a standout recruiting class, you've got the Bruins. Yeah, now you can hit the transfer portal. The Bruins tapped into that. Coach Inouye Perez, not afraid to do that. Go getting that. And then UCLA should have themselves a stacked roster. We'll tell you more about the players coming in in a moment. But UCLA with the most recent Pac-12 softball poll in the preseason. Picked to be number one. Only one first place vote going to someone other than the Bruins heading to Stanford's way. So UCLA is practically a near unanimous pick to win the Pac-12 this year. New to Pac-12 softball is the Pac-12 softball conference tournament at the end of the year held by the Arizona Wildcats. So it's the first time ever that'll be the end of season conference tournament to technically decide the auto bid. And then eventually everything will get sorted from there. But for the Bruins who are number two in the country, just behind Oklahoma, who's won back-to-back ships, one of the best teams in the country, one of the best teams in history last year. How do you compete with a Sooner team that's bringing almost everybody back other than Jocelyn Allo? Well, this is what UCLA has coming in the portal. This is what UCLA went out and brought in. They brought in Charlize Palacios, Brooke Yanez, Janelle Meonio, and then Rachel Sid. Those are two players from Oregon and Arizona saying, hey, we're going to tap on the West Coast, get the premier talent. People have already proven it, either being first team all Pac-12 players, Pac-12 freshman of the year candidates, players who have already proven they can do it in the circle or out in or swinging the bat, finding a way to just lengthen their lineup for a team that's losing their top three hitters from a year ago. 
how do you do that? How do you replace? Well, now with the portal, UCLA wasn't afraid to do so. With Brooke Yanez, you're getting a player who missed all of last year, but had a 197 ERA, 31 and 7 in her career, and over 360 strikeouts and over 200 innings worked in her career after missing a full season from a year ago, looking to be another workhorse alongside Reagan Frimo, Megan Frimo, excuse me, the reigning Pac-12 pitcher of the year. So you're getting someone in some bulk. While there are some freshmen coming in, that could be that immediate replacement for Holly Acevedo. Then coming in from Arizona, Charlize Palacios, 39 career home runs, 128 RBIs. That's someone who can be a big bat, big home run threat, bring some pop in that lineup that the Bruins needed, get that veteran presence in bringing over Palacios. And these are two players between Giannis of Palacios of five Bruins who were picked in the preseason all Pac-12 team. And that we'll get to that list additionally beyond that. But between Palacios and Yanez, those are two players. Mayonio struggled last year, only hit 291, but she was the Pac-12 freshman of the year a couple of years ago, this being her fourth year of college softball because she was a COVID freshman. So for Janelle Mayonio coming over, struggling last year, struggling 291, I say. A stretch fracture in her foot almost took her out two months. And her team, when she was with the Wildcats last year with Arizona, 14 and 11 without her, lost eight consecutive games with her out of the lineup. So that's a key piece who, when she was healthy, batted over 400, Pac 12 freshman of the year, could be a key cog in this lineup for the Bruins, getting Mayonio, who still got a couple of years left to play for UCLA. And then Rachel Sid. Rachel Sid, having a good batting average, was a first team all Pac 12 or not too long ago. She looks to be competing for a starting spot and a key weapon for a UCLA team that last year when Aaliyah Jordan, more on her later, went down, the Bruins didn't have that full lengthy lineup from one through nine that can compete with the most vaunted offenses in the country, considering what? They went to Stanford, had two one zero losses that lost them the series. When they went to ASU, when they lost to Oklahoma at the end of the year, too many low-scoring games, too many shutouts. I get, yes, you're facing the premier pitchers, the best arms in the country, but just it wasn't that vaunted offense when they had the Rachel Garcia-led teams and the dual threat pop that they had when they had, you know, a national championship team almost three, now four years ago coming up upon from that 2019 ship before COVID. And whatever that 2020 season was, that waste, that heartbreak there where the Bruins could have maybe gone back to back with those two seasons. But here we are, a reloaded, retooled team with four key transfers that all expect to maybe see some playing time, at least initially, to help compete for UCLA going forward. Now we'll tell you, after we talk to you about FanDuel, we'll tell you more about who's coming back, who could be a key piece for the Bruins between the newcomers and one injured player who I've already mentioned, and what the schedule looks like. We're going to tell you about that moving forward. But first, let's tell you about FanDuel, because FanDuel is the newest sports betting partner and is the sports betting partner of Locked On, because they're the number one sports book in America. That's right, in America. So what do you want to do? You should go and look at their great betting features. You can go bet Super Bowl 57 with a no-sweat first bet, up to $3,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet does not win. How do you do that? We have to download the FanDuel app. It's free and it's safe, easy, to secure to use. Or you can go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to claim your no sweat first bet. It's a mouthful, but it's a no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57 to get your $3,000 back in bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win on the Super Bowl for money line, point spreads, who will score a touchdown? That's what you can bet on. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL and with us here at Locked On. Cruising on with Locked On UCLA, Zach Anderson, Yox, I'm with you guys doing a softball preview. They get their season started against Cal State Fullerton, and it'll be a couple weeks before the Bruins get some true, talented, tough matchups in the non-conference and then into the grind of Pac-12 play. The first week at home with the Stacey Winsberg should be a fairly confident, easy week for the Bruins. And if it's not, well, you know, it might be a rough year compared to the preseason expectations as UCLA looks excuse me, looks to go to eight straight women's college world series. They've gone to seven straight starting back in 2015, all the way through now, 
If you eliminate the COVID year, the Bruins have been a relentless force competing amongst the nation's elite. And what makes them elite? Well, even when you lose your top three hitters and one of your top two pitchers, you reload, you retool, and one of the key players who can make an impact, the story we should all talk about, Aaliyah Jordan, in her seventh year coming back, was having a good first eight games of the season before tearing her ACL, is back for her seventh year with the injury red with the medical red shirt with the red shirt and the covid year all costing her three seasons Aaliyah jordan could be that key cog impact bat for the bruins this season if she's healthy back to herself she's been nfca first team regions all americans she has been key re, she was a key reason why the bruins won that championship i believe in the national championship series against oklahoma in 19 hit what a home run in each of those games against the sooners drove in runs so for Aaliyah jordan that is someone, while you are missing your top three hitters from last year, you're, you're getting someone back beyond just a couple of players you're getting in the portal and the freshman you're bringing in. You're bringing in Aaliyah Jordan, who hopefully healthy, wise veteran, can be that veteran presence in the locker room with the talent and get her one last season with a good send-off as opposed to something rough like an injury had, was able to get that year back and help the Bruins climb over the mountain and knock the Sooners off their perch as they seem to think they're the best softball program in America. The Bruins need to stake that claim and Leah Jordan to be one of those players alongside with some of these freshmen, like a Taylor Tinsley, who's amongst the top recruits, the top pitching recruit in the country. You have a Megan Grant or a Jordan Rooley, who is what number three in the country in recruiting. So the few freshmen the Bruins brought in stacked, which could, while we don't know at this moment, based on how they'll play, they could make immediate impacts or might be a one to two year waiting period with every sport, with every recruit. You just never know how long it takes for them to adapt. But the Bruins getting four, four people from the portal, Mionio, Yanez, Palacios, and Sid. You bring Aliyah Jordan back, you get freshmen, and that could retool a team who they've got veteran experience between those players coming back, albeit in different eras for different teams. You bring in the freshmen, and that could be a very talented roster. Maybe could go through some lumps and get some bad losses here and there against some tough teams. But UCLA is set up for success. They, they are set up for success in 2023. Anything short of playing the National Championship Series and being that close to the National Championship Series like the Bruins were last year would it be kind of a frustrating thing. Which leads us to transitioning into segment three. For locked on UCLA. What are the expectations for UCLA? What does this schedule look like? Well, with the addition of the Pac-12 Conference Tournament, you're going to look at this UCLA schedule for the 2023 year and see there's one less tournament the player the, the Bruins will be playing in the beginning part of the schedule. It's not like you have all those tournaments stacked down, usually the Stacey Winsbergs a little bit later. Compared to last year, a little bit later in the schedule, it's actually to start off the year, and then you get your Mary Nutters, you, you get the... Judy Garmin's, the Clearwater Invitational. We go over to Florida like they did last year and years past. So those are the four tournaments you get to play in as opposed to four or five or a makeshift playing out at Easton Stadium. UCLA gets that conference tournament, which will be another two, three games at least, depending on the format. I haven't really looked deeply into the format yet, but based on the conference tournament, it could be another tough pair of games because based on what the rankings you use, UCLA has been the clear number two in almost every ranking from the coaches, the ESPN, the D1 softballs, the everything. They're clear number two behind a clear number one in Oklahoma, at least coming into this season. But you could argue UCLA schedule is as equally tough as it gets. You can see as low as 21 games or as many as 30 plus, depending on which rankings you use, which teams are receiving votes. And basically more than half the schedule, UCLA's opponents are either receiving votes or in the top 25. For the Bruins, I did a little a mock-up. If you only count the teams, I use D1 softball's rankings, but if you only count those teams, you still got to play Washington three games, Stanford, Oregon, Arizona. And in some rankings, people have Arizona State at number two, 22. So that could be at least 15 games in Pac-12 series that are all ranked in tough places to play. Of course, the one everybody's going to circle, February 26th, as opposed to last season when the Bruins played Oklahoma in the first weekend of the season, ended up going one and two against the Sooners from the first weekend, interestingly enough, all the way to the end of the season with their season ending to the Sooners, being one of just three teams 
to beat Oklahoma throughout that ridiculous campaign the Sooners posted last year. The Bruins get Oklahoma February 26th on a Sunday morning. Sunday morning, they get Florida State, Florida, Alabama, Northwestern, who the Bruins had a couple of fun clashes with last year, Kentucky, Central Florida, and one of those non-Power 5 schools that can be very good. So the Bruins' schedule is absolutely loaded. And you'll notice this year with this schedule, a little bit more scheduling quirks with the addition of the Pac-12 tournament. You have a lot more midweeks against an LMU, against a UC San Diego, Long Beach State and Fulwich, and they normally get their game or two in versus UCLA. But almost every week in between the Pac-12 game, you're going to get your midweek here and there, almost like kind of like baseball. I noticed I went back to the schedule, and you'll see after the tournaments are so front-loaded, during Pac-12 play, you'll see more midweeks, especially more than last year for Coach Inouye Perez's team, which makes me would love to pick her mind about that and how the scheduling worked. But a lot more midweeks, trying to make her team maybe a little bit sharper throughout the weekend series, considering you go a week without a game, you no-show a couple of days in the Pac-12 series with some equally good top talent. And all of a sudden, like last year, they took their most conference losses in almost five, seven to eight years with the first double-digit loss campaign in close to seven years. This is the team with the talent to do so. And UCLA, they are flat-out good. There's no reason to think that they won't be good. Because you want to know what? This is who's coming back. Let's go over quickly who is coming back beyond just an Alita Jordan from this year's team. Of course, what? Megan Paramo, who is the reigning Pac-12 player of the year, Pac-12 pitcher of the year, excuse me, you have the likes of Savannah Pola, Maya Brady, Kelly Gooden, Seneca Kuro. Those are just players who are playing. And amongst the three players I did not name in the Pac-12 preseason, you have Aaliyah Jordan, who's coming off injury. Primo, the pitcher of the year last year, with 24 wins, 292 Ks, and almost 10 Ks per complete game. So it's over 10 strikeouts per seven innings and two solo perfect games. And then Maya Brady, who... Is going to get a lot of recognition, of course, with her familial relation. But for Maya Brady, a stud in her own right, last year coming off a 339 campaign, pulled a leading returner in batting average with 342. So the Bruins, with Brady, only having a little bit of pop with the returners. Jordan will help add to that with her coming off of injury. You would hope one, Charlize Palacios, can help add to the pop in that lineup, extend it, and maybe not have as many shutouts as they did last year in some of those losses but the Bruins are here to compete and anything less than a national championship series appearance will be kind of disappointing you never know but I think this year a little bit boom or bust this year we'll, we'll find out the first couple of weeks and we'll recalibrate see if this year but I feel pretty highly about this Bruins team number two in the country we'll see what this first ever conference tournament looks like for the Pac-12 what this looks like moving forward for the conference and of course what does this mean for the Bruins moving forward when they move to the Big Ten? How does that change things with Northwestern dominating over in the Pac-12? North uh, Pac Big Ten. Northwestern is the highest ranked team in the Big Ten. And the Big Ten does not really make up a lot of the top 25 in softball. So what does this mean in their second to last campaign in the Pac-12? Do they want to go out champs with the conference tournament? All things the Bruins are slowly building because... You know, basketball, they're going to thrive or they're they are going to take their money with crucial matchups every game. Football, what does that mean for baseball and softball? Well, softball might might hurt them. We'll see. Maybe the money in the Big Ten and everything will help just generate everything with all the traveling they'll do. But for UCLA, look, it'll be one last time in the final, one of the last two seasons, Pac-12 softball champs in you know, the national championship to put up there and knock Oklahoma off their perch, perch because, you know, they're losing one of the best players of all time. The Bruins could certainly, despite three key players gone, some fifth years, COVID seniors leaving last year, and then not far removed from, you know, Rachel Garcia being on the team. The Bruins have lost some key crucial players, but they have hit the portal. They've got a top-tier recruiting class for this season. And the returners, well, they've mostly performed, and they played under the lights when they've been the brightest, with the double-decker bleachers out of Oklahoma City when they're now packing it with 11,000 Oklahoma primetime lights all together. And the Bruins did beat Oklahoma. Now let's see what it means this year when you're probably going to face them maybe more than once, depending on how the schedule looks like going forward. It'll be interesting. It'll be exciting. Just a little preview nugget here 
for Locked On Usually. I thought it would be an interesting idea. Who's coming? Again, you have Tinsley, Grant, Wooley, Kennedy Powell. Those are all players who are all listed as freshmen, key players that we could see how they develop, if their immediate impact, or if we wait for them to develop throughout this season and the rest of their Bruins careers. And then what do the transfers do? Is this the new age of UCLA softball? Well, they can go, hey, we're going to get these players, replace our three top hitters, get these players back, bring in Aaliyah Jordan, and the team can look good with already Amaya Brady coming back in company. We're expecting big things out of these Bruin women, and we hope they are successful in doing so. So UCLA fans, be excited. Hopefully they kick Fullerton's butt and do it in dominating fashion. Maybe a no-hitter, perfect game, first game. Who knows? Get your hands in the air, Bruins fans. Eight clap time, baby. Let's go. Get a national title, baby. Just be like the women's soccer team and get another natty on the board for this season. And go check out Locked On College Basketball. Make that your second listen. Zach Anderson, the Oxheimer, setting off. Eight clap time, baby. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You see LA. You see LA. Fight, fight, fight. Go Bruins. Kick some butt. In February 26th, all the eyes will be watching. But if you're watching, you'll be paying attention during this first weekend as well, all throughout the rest of this season. Go Bruins. Kick some butt. This has been Locked On UCLA. Go Bruins.